Uh, this was a presentation that uh, I'm, I was initially slightly reluctant to do because I'm not speaking to data in this, but I think that it's a really important one to make because there's a few really important points to make in relation to uh, opportunities for online radicalization and the online environment and its changes in the last couple of years. So um, from the outset, what I'll say is um, I'd really, really suggest that you look, uh, if you're interested in this area, at the, the peripheral uh, associated uh, research from people like Bettina Rottweiler from UCL, uh, Ryan Scribbins uh, from the United States. They're doing fantastic work in this area. Our focus is on Australia, um, and I'll, I'll speak to that in a moment. I won't be speaking about the dark net, and, and that will, uh, I'll, I'll describe why that is. If you're interested in dark net research, we've got some experts in the corner of the room, which I'd, I'd suggest you speak to Rod Broadhurst and Matt Ball, they're brilliant in that field. This is about open, open web. Um, so the internet has become an increasingly important place for extremism, and uh, it will remain an important place. The, the reasons for us speaking about it at the moment, though, are because there's been some real changes in the research recently, um, and, and for really important reasons. But when we speak generally about the internet, we, there is a tendency to diminish its important, importance by uh, collecting a, a huge, enormous environment. It's almost like saying we're trying to affect um, deviance on the internet is kind of like saying we're trying to deal with violence in Europe. It's generalizing massively, um, and, and it diminishes the importance of the task. Um, so what do we know about online radicalization? Well, from 2015 onwards or so, there was a, a real um, proliferation in research into the internet, and that was fantastic. But really, the question now is, what did we know about online radicalization? Because the environment has substantially changed. Um, when COVID came about, the uh, cohorts using the internet, the, the, um, the characteristics of those individuals um, and the risk factors uh, for those that were being exposed to uh, extremist content online, um, we, we saw some changes. And um, if anyone was in the session yesterday looking at youth radicalization, I'll quote Steve Barracosa in this, in that he's, he was saying when dealing with youth, he wishes we could go back 10 years because we'd just be dealing with or well, predominantly be dealing with uh, jihadist ideologies. And that was okay because there was a hierarchy, it was understandable, it was, uh, uh, there were opportunities for de-radicalization that were known. Now, that's not necessarily the case now. It's a disparate kind of cohort, um, a, a different uh, set of individuals that are exposed to this extremist content. Um, at the ARC, uh, I'm lucky enough to work a bit with fixated threat assessment centers with Emily. Um, Emily was speaking to uh, speaking on them earlier on, and I asked um, one of the uh, police employees of an FTAC uh, in Australia last week. Um, although it's peripherally associated, slightly different uh, grievance fueled area, I asked I asked this person um, what they were seeing. What, what was the uh, the ideological background of the individuals they were dealing with? Um, this FTAC has a lot of lot to do with um, uh, the CVE coordinator, and they were saying. Before COVID, it, it made more sense. Now we're seeing a lot of sovereign citizens. We, we can't stop finding uh, or, or um, uh, receiving referrals relating to sovereign citizens. And when we deal with them, it's kind of like trying to grab a hold of smoke because the backgrounds are so diverse, the exposures are so different, um, and the risks that they pose are so different. And as a result, when it comes to online radicalization, we know that the distribution of content to individuals like these uh, are a real risk factor. So I am speaking to a literature review. Um, we, we initially uh, grabbed a whole lot of um, research published after 2015, and we brought that together and thought, what are we going to learn from this? And then we tried to apply it from COVID onwards. And simply put, there are some things that are applicable, and there are some things that have changed. So broadly, online domains, what do they help uh, um, uh, in the distribution of extremist content. So if I asked you all, um, subject matter experts and not, why the internet is a risk for uh, online radicalization, I'm sure that we would have gotten all of these factors regardless of your background. Um, the distribution of propaganda is pivotal in this area. 
But then when we think about the distribution of propaganda, what areas, what domains do we think about the distribution of propaganda for, uh, for radicalization? Again, this has pivoted slightly. Even in the last couple of years, uh, we've had conversations with government bodies, conversations with researchers. Uh, almost across the board, we hear things about the gaming, um, gaming, uh, um, online gaming, sorry to say. Um, things like uh, TikTok, um, particularly targeting youth, um, getting younger and younger. Again, throwing to uh, Steve Barakos yesterday, working with um, Youth Justice, their average age is 14 years old. It's a very young cohort. And the exposure on gaming platforms such as Steam or Discord or Twitch, I mean, Twitch should come directly to mind given the streaming of extremist events through Twitch platforms. It's a really important uh, method for distributing um, propaganda. Um, but really importantly, and, and referring to the darknet, we're not seeing platforms that are necessarily difficult to obtain access to. These are free domains that people can access simply enough um, on, on any given day, but these domains are an access point for extremist propaganda. And this then leads to recruitment. So, and I'll touch on this a bit later on, but we know that um, online radicalization is very unlikely to happen solely online. Although it can be an access point, still the research points to at least uh, one or more in-person contact before um, onset of radicalization or planning. Um, but as a recruitment point, is a very powerful um, platform or uh, online domains are very powerful for recruitment into um, extremist groups. Fundraising. Uh, it's, it's an essential point, and again, we're talking about the open web. We've had discussions with stakeholders talking about, yes, while there are certain platforms, for example, Facebook uh, stores, that are used for legitimate purposes, they can be used as well for uh, fundraising for extremist groups. Um, it's a very popular and almost unregulated method for generating funds for certain groups and the planning and execution of attacks. Um, obviously, live streaming, um, we've seen this uh, across to a, a range of platforms, even onto uh, Facebook and the like. But really importantly, this closes the loop. This brings us back to distribution of propaganda. Um, when you see uh, streaming online, the planning and execution of, of attacks, it, it's, a, it's a circular uh, environment that leads to the distribution and uh, of propaganda and recruitment. So, this isn't rocket science. It's, the risk factors are fairly straightforward. Um, the wide reach, ex easy accessibility, minimal censorship, uh, online anonymity, and the speed of information flow are absolutely essential. But it's the multimedia uh, opportunities for distribution of propaganda um, and uh, compiling these risk factors that are really key in this field. Um, and to harp on again, um, Video gaming and violent extremism uh, is presenting a significant risk because it is, it's almost unregulated and I'm not suggesting that this is the sole risk or even the predominant risk, but as something that's emerged and become a more significant threat during COVID, uh, it's something that um, we need a closer look at and to understand that, that field much more, particularly given the engagement with uh, youth and younger and younger cohorts. But like I said, people don't solely become radicalized due to the internet. And a large proportion of people that are exposed to extremist content online are exposed passively. They don't necessarily look for it. They might be looking for another type of content. They might just have a really high risk threshold for their uh, online behaviors, and that might lead them to come across extremist content online. We're not necessarily talking about a group of people who are negotiating the dark net and how to obtain this content um, uh, proactively. We're not necessarily even talking about people who uh, find themselves on the, um, on the chans, the, the forums that are just incredibly well known, although there will be a, a group of individuals who proactively look for it on there. And typ typically, as um, Paul's keynote, Paul Gill's keynote yesterday mentioned, uh, there will be pre-existing risk factors that uh, predispose individuals to be at higher risk of radicalization involving online content. What we're, we're not fundamentally certain of is 
are those risk factors differ, different from those that radicalize uh, through individual uh, engagement, through real world contact alone? Um, what those risk factors look like can differ significantly. But really importantly, um, the uh, speed of transfer of information, the, the um, engagement between individuals, um, the recent attack, the uh, shooting in Buffalo in the US, the, this individual produced a, a um, manifesto. That manifesto um, plagiarized significantly from the Christchurch attack. And that manifesto plagiarized significantly from Anders Breivik. It's a, it's a really consistent factor that there's learning and there's transfer of information across the internet between these individuals. Um, 180 pages is a long uh, manifesto to write, uh, even for someone undertaking that kind of attack, and to see a significant amount of plagiarism from other, uh, other extremists is a really important point. There's no way that they would have necessarily had that access if it weren't for uh, online domains. So what changed? And why am I talking about COVID? Why is it not the same as it was before? Uh, posting behavior increased significantly. We know this. Um, but particularly on uh, um, right-wing uh, and uh, incel forums. Um, not necessarily so much as far as the current research would suggest uh, on left-wing forums. Um, There was a significant increase in discontentment throughout COVID because of the lockdowns, uh, because of um, online discussion around vaccine mandates and things like this. There's, there, if, if you drove into uh, the conference today, if you drove down Northbourne, you would have seen some um, graffiti talking about the um, peanut convoy. Um, the COVID convoy in Canberra was uh, a really significant event for us, and it was um, something that really uh, was emblematic of the discord within the community around that. But it is there is a sense that uh, we should trivialise these events. I tend to disagree. I don't think that they necessarily should be trivialised. I think they're a really important cultural point. And I think that our stakeholders at FTACs or uh, CVE coordinators would also suggest that around those kinds of events, we've seen an increase in... Uh, um, uh, extremist ideologies around sovereign citizenship and things like this. I think that those are really emblematic and we, we should try to move away from trivializing them to an extent. Um, it tends to push these individuals further, to, further towards the fringe. Um, and make them more vulnerable, to be perfectly honest, more vulnerable to the types of rhetoric that, that is seen online. But. COVID has formed part of extremist narratives, and we do need to take it very seriously. Um, that's an opportunity that was opened up to a range of ideologies. It wasn't just uh, far right. It wasn't just sovereign citizen ideologies. Um, there were uh, all types of groups that tried to take advantage of that, and quite successfully did. In particular, going on uh, domains like TikTok, um, targeting youth and trying to roll youth upwards. These are really, frankly, quite successful techniques that have been used and are now, we're seeing through our FTAC stakeholders, through our uh, CBE coordinators, we're seeing increasing numbers of um, individuals promoting these types of ideologies in schools or education um, through the mental health sector among young people. Um, all of this uh, we can relate back to, at least to some extent, the ability to distribute propaganda uh, and to mobilize COVID conspiracies uh, for different ideological areas. So traditionally, what would we do? And this is from, from pre-COVID times, and this is the prevailing thought process now. Um, online content detection and removal, um, making it uh, more difficult, creating more barriers for individuals to access that type of content online. Um, suspending extremist uh, or known radical accounts disrupting the flow of information from, from the source, um, reducing individuals' anonymity and the ability to post anonymously and get away with it, um, and to uh, produce counter-narratives. Now, these are all from pre-COVID times. The, the prevailing thought is that they remain. Can anyone see an issue that's only happened in the last couple of weeks with these points? Twitter. Um, Twitter has been purchased, obviously, by an individual, uh, and, and the promotion of that idea is to 
reduce um, the uh, scrutiny of what individuals can post. Um, freedom of expression, a really important factor in Western democracies. But when we talk about extremist propaganda online and the promotion of extreme uh, viewpoints online, it becomes a significant risk. Um, online content detection and removal uh, on one of the largest platforms in the world may become um, significantly hindered. Um, although uh, I use Twitter as an example, that's not necessarily to say that uh, other platforms are significantly better. Um, but we do have opportunities in that area. There are um, opportunities for, for using emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, things like this to identify these types of content, these types of accounts, and disable them proactively. But it requires buy-in from the private sector and a genuine uh, um, keenness to implement those processes among uh, their platforms. So yes, in an ideal world, I think all of these would be extremely effective, but we're not in that ideal world. And there are um, certain barriers that come up to their implementation. So I mentioned Twitter, but that's not the only platform. And I'm only talking uh, on the free web. Um, platforms such as YouTube, uh, really simply, they're quite good at content moderation, but they're not perfect. And there is still quite um, a, a uh, um, extensive catalog of radicalized content, uh, of extremist propaganda floating around on YouTube. Um, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, Facebook, the list goes on. Um, really, there is no platform that's without uh, risk in this area. Even LinkedIn, I know that sounds a bit crazy, but you know, I, some of the posts on LinkedIn, good Lord, they really are extremist. Um, Counter-narrative campaigns are fantastic. Um, they're theoretically uh, really valuable but they, they tie in to the removal of content. They're most powerful when you can uh, approach the issue from both sides. One, removing content. Two, flagging uh, individuals that are promoting that content. And three, removing uh, that content and providing a counter-narrative, uh, an opposing viewpoint, something that is uh, attractive and approachable to um, an individual. And then di digital and media literacy, particularly among youth. Um, extremely powerful, particularly for at-risk groups. But again, uh, it, mobilizing these types of campaigns on a large scale, accessing the individuals that are most at risk, and making sure that you can have the effect that you need, um, it's an uphill battle. And there are challenges. So uh, the hosting of platforms outside of jurisdictions, um, it is a labor-intensive effort, and there is a genuine dedication within government, particularly in Australia, about uh, implementing some of these approaches, about engaging with industry and making uh, real inroads. But it's a massive, massive field. And um, promotion of extremist propaganda is uh, uh, it's an uphill battle, to put it politely. And again, concerns for freedom of expression are legitimate. They're absolutely legitimate, and it's not to diminish them. But again, uh, some level of balance or some degree of balance. So I've told you all the problems. Um, and I'd love to be able to answer them. I'd love to be able to put together uh, something for you that would um, suggest what, uh, what we can do next. What I can see what we're doing, what I can say is that the AIC is putting together or has put together and has uh, in the field a survey of 13,000 Australians relating specifically to um, online radicalization and accessing extremist uh, content online. So we're surveying um, 13,000 individuals. Uh, it's a population survey um, proportional to the demographics of Australia. And we're going to be asking things like uh, um, the online behaviors of individuals how they accessed uh, extremist content, did they share that content, um, what their individual characteristics are, psychosocial characteristics. Um, we're going to follow up about um, engagement in uh, protest activity and what that meant for them and what, that um, what, that, what impact that had on them. Um, so look, everything I, I, to kind of round out what I've been uh, trying to say is that um, during COVID, things changed a lot, and we had some really great research in this area, and we had some really great understandings coming forward. 
across the world, but COVID did tend to reset that in, in small part because a huge number of people that weren't access, accessing this content were suddenly accessing this content. They were online more, they may have had a higher degree of, uh, of risk tolerance during COVID by virtue of being so online. And that's led to a really different risk environment. So what we know or what we knew might not be now what we know. We may know something different now. And uh, what we really need to find out is who's accessing this, in, this information, uh, what their characteristics are, and then try to see if our uh, prevailing ideas of how to deal with this cohort are still true. Thank you very much. Thank you.